Why? We're going to start what winds up being the meeting of West Side Association. And I know that Brandy has a lot of stuff to put out. We're mostly going to favor her. Um, but uh, as, as uh, the beekeepers all know, and as I'm sure you're beginning to find out, we are having a rather unusual year in terms of the amount of lovely things that are all blooming at once way too early. Um, so I guess I have, my primary question is, how are your bees? Anyone, anyone uh, having anything to do? Anyone have a swarm yet? <laughs> anyone close to having a swarm yet based on looking in their hives? Uh, we're all playing ignorant, aren't we? Okay. Uh, how, how have we done for having hives die at this point? I know I had one that died. You had one, yeah. One out of three. One out of three, that's not bad. Anybody else have, have, a, have dead outs or particularly a usual number? Yeah. This is the season. We had a very, uh, one of my hives that was affected by uh, water. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah? Although I did look in there, I don't know. Did they look like they were dark, or did they have? No, oh, they have plenty of honey. Yeah. <coughs> yes, they do have honey. Yep. Mm -hmm. and so should you be feeding them now? Yes. Should, should you be feeding them now? Oh uh, boy, there's a lot of discussion. Feed yes or no? I know the maples are blooming around about. But um, ours are not. Oh, really? uh, our big leaf maples are still still. Uh, yeah, well they're weeds, but they're not. The dandelions are starting. That's good. Everything else has been blooming. My bees have been very successful, so I am reluctant to feed them. And the, one, the hive I looked in, the, my strongest hive, had stores all the way to the back. So the hive that had stores are probably doing okay still, but keep an eye on them. Um, I guess would be the thing I'd say. Are you any of you guys feeding? No, uh, you are. Are they taking it? Yeah, the one hive is. The other hive has stores. Yes, yeah, I'll have one hive. The other one is just sort of sitting there saying, what's this for? All right, well, what I'm going to do is, if we don't have any other catastrophic bee things happening, is turn this over to Brandy Williams, who is going to discuss beekeeping today, which is to say beekeeping for about the last 10,000 years, because Brandy's an historian, so today has a really long feel to it. Sorry. Ah, I'll hold it real still. Um, so everyone knows, I think that this Brandy, is... Would you like a regular mic? Uh, yeah, I'd love a regular mic. I think everyone knows that this is a combined meeting. This is the beginning class, and then this is also the bee club meeting. So I want to talk a little bit about the bee club for those of you who haven't had a chance to be at another meeting. Um, and I, you may have gotten this information before, it may be the second time that you've gotten it, so that's great. Always good to know. Does this also work? I'll just stand here in the You notice the, the, the elegant shirt which I am wearing, which uh, Frank. Why don't you want here? That's yeah, yeah. Can you shine my But I want to be in the process. I am. Hear me again? Yes. <laughs> that didn't work. Uh, West Ham Beekeeping Association. I was president for the last few years. I'm emeritus president this year, which is the best kind of president to be. And Ted is, of course, the current president. We have a, a mission statement which says that what we do for people is talk about keeping bees. It's an all-volunteer organization, but we really have a commitment to education. And you can see that um, there are so many people in the room who have a lot of knowledge and experience and are willing and, and excited to share it with you. Um, so what used to happen is we used to meet at Stedman's, which is up the hill, and we'd have a beginning class, and then the club would come into the class, and you get a chance to, to benefit from the wisdom of people who have been keeping bees for a while. And since we outgrew that, for the last five or six years, the class has just been going up and up and up. So we outgrew the space, so we brought the class here, and then it was George's cunning idea to have the club meeting here, so we could once again mix y'all with the, mix the, the people out here who have been with the club for a while with those of you who have just started the class. So that's what this is about. So we normally have speakers. Um, 
you know that you're in the apprenticeship program. That's one of the things that we offer. You're a member of the club since you became an apprentice. So that's great. <coughs> and that offers you access to the email list, which is very important because the first year of beekeeping is so intense. And the, the least little thing that happens to the hive feels like the end of the world. So you'll get to post to the list and ask questions, and you can gain access to the uh, assembled wisdom of all the people here. Uh, we have club mentors. And really, most of them are in the room, actually. There are a number of classes. I'm sure that George has briefed you on the hands-on classes. And I urge you to take advantage of that. Nothing like getting your hands-on bees before you get your hands on your own bees. Same thing with the apiary. I think our apiary manager has is scampered. But we have a club apiary, which we, you know, you can come in and work on the apiary. That's where we hold our classes. And the um, the apiary is um, open for you to work with, and our apiary manager will have regular dates where you can come and work on the apiary. We have a wonderful library. Um, you have a bibliography, hopefully it's made its way around, that, that calls out some books, and Frank just called out um, Honeybee Democracy, which we do have one copy of, so you have to pass it around. It's a great book to have, actually. Uh, George is our librarian, and he has a really extensive collection of books about bees. Not the one I want, though. It's two hundred dollars. Isn't got it money yet? <laughs> we have a honey extractor. I don't know if you know this. If you uh, honey extractor is kind of expensive piece of equipment. We own one. You can check it out, and uh, when the time comes to spin your honey, you can have um, access to that piece of equipment too. So this is a you know kind of a pitch to continue to come to club meetings. Um, it's it's where you can connect with other beekeepers, and we have all these resources. We also have um, classes. We have. Um, really monthly meetings where we have speakers come and talk, and we start, as, as Ted did, with talking about what's going on with our bees, asking questions, and then we move into the topic of the day. There are a couple of speakers that I'm um, the speaker coordinator this year, so I know we're going to have Dana Coggin, who is the Kitsap County Noxious Weeds Coordinator, very important person to us, very, very friendly to the club, so we're going to have her come and talk to us. We're going to have Bob Coombs, who is the Master Beekeeper of Washington State, Master Beekeeper Coordinator, and he has been keeping bees for 30 years, and he does completely foundationless in Langstrip and Moray and Top Bar. So he's got a wealth of knowledge, and y'all will really enjoy him. Um, we'll talk about other bees, too. We'll talk about mason bees. So we'll have a speaker come in and talk to us about that. Uh, Stedman's is really just like almost walking distance from here, just around the corner. Really easy to get to. Uh, park in the high school across the street. You can find parking. We have a couple of things that we do that are club activities, because we're a club, it's a social thing. So we have a picnic in August, uh, people come and bring their pies, and you know, we sit out in the sunshine because it is sunny in August. In um, December we have our holiday party, which is my favorite holiday party. It's, it's got lots of good food, lots of good people. Um, we announce the Beekeeper of the Year, some years we even manage to keep that from the Beekeeper of the Year, which is great. The, the big thing, we do a lot of outreach. Um, like one and one or, or you know, a couple of us will go out and talk to schools. The big thing we do as a club is the county fair. We have an arrangement with the master gardeners. Are there, are there any master gardeners? Ah, yes. We have an arrangement with the master gardeners that we share the open, open horticulture booth, which is in the president's hall. So they have you know tables like this that are filled with squashes. And squashes are not the big draw that you might expect them to be. So they, they have us come in and set up the booth. That's Ted there in the, the booth last year. And that's after hours. As soon as we put the demo hive down on the booth, then we're constantly answering questions. So we have two or three people um, each shift to come and talk, uh, answer people's questions about these. So you, you have an opportunity to do that. And as first year beekeepers, you're the best people to talk to beginners. I want to tell you, you have just this much knowledge, and that's all that someone needs. They, they walk up to you and ask you a question. They don't need to know 10 ways to split your hive. <laughs> you know, so I've aged out of that. I, I've been keeping these for five years. And you ask me a question, and I start seeing the eyes glaze over. You know, so, so I encourage everyone to, to take the opportunity to volunteer with the club. It's great fun. And you can also enter your honey. Uh, our, one of our beekeepers of the year, Kim Redmond, has a arrangement with the fair. She came in and taught them how to judge honey. So really, they know what they're looking at when they're looking at your honey, which is awesome. So I encourage everyone to enter your honey. We don't have enough entrance. We need more entrance. Put them in, put them in jars. My actual, so that's the pitch for the club. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about, though, was sort of a big picture of beekeeping. What's the context in which 
we're keeping these. When I first started keeping these, I wanted to know, you know, um, why people were telling me what they were telling me. And I wanted to make my own decisions about how to keep bees. Now, the thing is, when, when you know nothing about bees, and you are handed a package of bees, which is like a living thing, and you put them in your equipment, we want, as a club, to tell you what you need to know to get those bees through the next few months of their life so you don't kill them right away. Many of us have done this, so we want you to benefit from our experience. Um, so we just give you these little pieces of information, and different people, I don't, I don't know if this, you've noticed this with your, with your friend, um, teachers, but different people have different perspectives and different ways of looking at beekeeping, right? Have all your teachers agreed with each other? This can't be true. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I, I, I get a little piece of information here and a little piece of information here, and I built a picture, which as time went on turned out to be, you know, not really accurate in terms of what was really going on in the world of beekeeping. So I spent the last five years going to conferences. I went to state conferences, uh, regional conference, a couple of treatment-free conferences, um, and I came up with sort of a, an image of where we are in beekeeping. So this is really the 50,000 foot view. You've been doing a lot of you know, discussion in the class about very specific details. I'm going to give you like up here, you're flying over Mount Rainier, and this is the mountain you're looking at. So how long have people kept bees? I won't spend that much time on history. Um, where in the world do people keep bees? What are bees? What are bees? What ways have people thought about how bees live? How do bees fit into agriculture? You, how many people have heard that bees are dying? Right? You see the, the little Facebook meme come by, you know, this is your grocery store without bees. So bees are in the news. So what does that mean? And are they really in danger of dying, truly? And how can we help? So just a little bit of history, how people have kept bees, and what kind of technological advances we've made. Um, the master gardener here will appreciate this. I'll spend one minute on this. <laughs> this is the honeybee taxonomy. Uh, different people have different ways of looking at how to split up what bees are. Our bees are um, Hymenoptera. And that's where a lot of people's understanding stops. George has one. Is George still here? George has one in his pocket. He's got a hymenoptera in his pocket. Because hymenoptera covers wasps and bees and ants. Now, the club is actually interested in all of this. You get a call on the swarm list. I've learned to ask, you know, okay, you, you say you have a swarm. Is it under the eaves of your garage? Does it have a paper cone? Are there, there are things coming in now? Because that's a wasp. It's not a bee. And people will tell you, oh, yeah, I got stuff on a bee. What they mean is wasp, right? That's, that's, that's as far as they get in understanding bees. Your understanding of bees will come down here. You know that you'll have an insect, it's a hymenoptera, and it belongs to the bee class, honeybees, and your bee is going to be the western honeybee. It's going to be Apis mellifera. There are several kinds. Some of you know this because you're starting to, to talk about getting your packages, and you've been asked if you want Italians or Carniolans. Right, so there are four kinds of Apis mellifera you will normally hear us talk about. Italian bees, Carniolan bees, uh, Russian bees, and Africanized bees. We don't have those here. They have them in the southern part of the United States. They are not killer bees. They will not hurt you. Beekeepers, well, they will hurt But I mean, uh, they're, they're not going to um, destroy beekeeping. There are beekeepers who are keeping those kinds of bees, and good reasons why, why they are working with the bee that's kind of, kind of intense. You need more protective equipment, though. But your bee is going to be almost certainly an Italian bee, very, very gentle bee. Now we've had a relationship with bees. Bees are, uh, we found a fossil, a hundred million year old bee fossil. So bees are a hundred million years old. Uh, we're, uh, as a species, about six million years old, so they rank us. I mean, they're, they're really uh, much older than us. We've had a relationship with bees for a long time. Our first relationship with bees is going and gathering honey, and so this is an image one of the oldest images that we have is somebody who's going and climbing in a cave and getting honey from the bees. It's a you know, form of robbing. You think of us as robbers. This is a guy who's taking uh, honey from a very large bee, Meg Apis, Apis dorsata. They build combs that are five feet wide. And you can see it's a Nepal, Tibet, Bhutan. You can see that he's got a scarf. Too close. Too close. Too close. <laughs> I have a box I have to scan in, okay, I'll be good. Uh, as long as I know that I'm good. 
So he's, he's using his skin of scarf to protect himself. His colleague here, <laughs> yeah. this is in Nepal, in your handout, the first thing in your handout is where you can go on a honey tour. You can go to Nepal and go with the villagers as they smoke the bees down at the bottom of the cliff. And then um, they, they lower this rope and a guy shimmies down. Another person at the top of the cliff has lowered a basket underneath the, the cone. And this uh, honey robber here is holding the basket with uh, his legs and poking with his arms. And you'll notice that he's upgraded to a contemporary bee suit, <laughs> which I can't help but think has got to be an improvement for him. But he's still got his hands and legs free, so hands and feet free. In Egypt, um, this is really great. We have an image of people keeping bees back, you know, 5,000 years, and they are smoking their bees. That's a ceramic smoker, which I think is really cool. They're getting a pretty good production, too. They're pouring into a, a jar. Um, honey was forever, until very, very, very recently, the sweetest thing humans could have. That's why we like it. That's why we rob it. That's why we keep bees, um, because, because it's a honey. We still find honey in tombs in Egypt. I won't do any more of that, but I want to show you the smoker and the kind of um, apiary that that person was working is a tube, lots of tubes that are clay tubes. Um, it, it's the desert, so here we're trying to keep our bees dry. In the north, they're trying to keep their bees warm. They're trying to keep their bees cool and out of the sun, and <coughs> shaded. This is an um, excavation. You've got the link on your bibliography, so you have to scribble madly. Um, and it's a lot of bees in the deserts. The location in Israel is Canaanite. And the excavator said, why do we have such a large apiary? It's a, it's a big urban environment. And I said, well, that answers the question I have, which is why is there such a large apiary in the desert? And it, an urban environment will give you the kind of forage that you need. So that's what it looks like. And they're big, right? So um, I should go back and say, the bees are going in and out of the front of the tube. The back of the tube, you can pull out and pull the honey out of it. And that's what it looks like. That's the back of the tube. So it's pretty big, it's pretty wide across. They actually experimented, we find, and, and tried to make the, the tubes bigger so the combs would be bigger, and then they fell. So they, they got a kind of sweet spot. Beekeepers have tinkered for thousands of years, is the, the, the end message there. We've had laws about how bees are kept for a long time. The, the laws in Athens you may have heard of in school included a law about how close you can keep your beehive to your neighbor's beehive, which is something we don't actually have. There would be people in this county who would be in trouble if we had to try to follow that law. Three hundred feet is a lot of space. And Aristotle, who you may have heard of in school, also talked. He talked about everything. And one of the things he talked about was bees, and he talked about how to manage them, how to. Um, how to smoke them, how to measure how much production you should have from the hive, and how, um, how you should try to keep honey for the bees to live on, which is what we're all working on. And that's one of the, that's, that's in use today, that's one of those uh, clay tube kind of things. You can see that they score it so that the, the bees will draw a comb uh, straight. I think it's cool. Uh, Virgil said, be careful where you put your bees so that the, the happy little animals do not knock it over. In our county, it's more like, or the bears don't go and get it. You heard about bears? You guys heard about bears? Have you heard about bears yet? You will hear about bears. <coughs> Someone took a wonderful image of how bees were kept in Greece. There are three kinds of hives here. There's a horizontal clay hive, a vertical clay hive, and a basket. And the basket gives you movable cones. So we know that the Egyptians had movable cones. Um, they, they were manipulating those clay tubes. They were splitting their hives. So in short, the kind of beekeeping that we've been doing, we are doing now today, goes back at least 5,000 years and probably longer than that. We have been moving hives around. We've been taking them to forage. We've been keeping them in the city. The city is a good place to keep bees. Um, we have been managing them, protecting them from predators. We have been figuring out how, what kind of production we get from the hives. So all of this is very old. So I hope that you were all inspired by that, actually. You're part of a, a long and worthy history of beekeeping. And another um, sort of message from that is that we haven't really changed beekeeping all that much 
in that period of time. The stuff that we're doing is stuff that people have been doing since we have related to these. Oh, the observation eyes. This is great. Um, Pliny said that he, he had a neighbor who found, like, I'm sorry George isn't here because he loved this story, he had a, a hive that had, uh, was made of translucent horn so he could look at the bees. So observation hives go back, you know, 5,000 years also. Yeah. <coughs> So what kind of ways have people thought about keeping bees? And it makes a difference to how we think about um, how we're going to manage the bees. And it turns out that the way we think about bees is really mostly how we think about ourselves. So there was Pliny and Virgil. This is an image of Virgil that's a medieval manuscript. So it doesn't have a lot to do with the Roman soldier. It has a lot to do with how medieval people kept bees in skeps. That was not a really great way to keep bees. You had to destroy the hive to get the honey out. Um, and what Pliny saw when he looked at the hive was a large bee that was directing what was happening in the hive. A king, a benevolent king who did not sting his subjects. Um, he saw advisors, he saw generals, he saw soldier bees. And the soldier bees, I'm not making this up, the soldier bees got awakened um, in the morning with a little bugle call. Do, 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 do. They all flew out to, to do their mission, and their mission was to gather honey because he didn't know they made honey. He thought it was you know, falling from the sky. They gather honey. If they, if they are caught out at night, the little bee bivouacks in a little leaf and then gets back to the hive the next day. But all those bees who did make it back to the hive had a common mess, they had a little dinner, and then they went to, to bed and started over again. So we have this sort of idea that the hive is a military operation. <laughs> In medieval Europe, of course, we had kings. And so we had a king, B still, um, who had advisors, leaders around him. And some of the medieval beekeepers looked in the hive and thought that they saw little castles on the little advisors. Uh, and we have plebeians. That's who the, the, the general run of bee is. They're, they're now plebeians. And drones. So we recognize that there's a kind of bee that's a larger bee that has a different kind of life than the other bees. The, um, and you might um, have a queen bee, not because we discovered that the bee was female, but that there was a queen sitting on the throne in England. You might call that bee a queen. Then as, um, in England at least, as, as uh, the times changed and a commonwealth took, took hold, there was an idea that the bees were kind of democracy. And you saw that idea go by in honeybee democracy. Bees are kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're running themselves. There's a master bee, the pro-rex, who is directing the activities of the hive, still male. Uh, and there are citizen bees. So there's a play called The Parliament of the Bees, where the citizen bees come and make complaints to the master bee about the depredations of wasps and, and bumblebees. <laughs> then we move into the Industrial Revolution and we get a factory model. We decided that the, bee, the, the beehive, the colony, was a way to make honey. And the bees, we still have a queen, and we still have drones, but now we have, instead of soldiers or plebeians or citizens, we have workers, and the workers are interchangeable. Um, we can measure the success of a hive by how much honey the hive produces. And Langstroth came sort of right in the middle of that, and so one of the, the reasons that we have this hive that we think of as a standard hive is because that was the industrial model. You have a hive that you can produce in vast quantities, and you can, you can do things with them as a consequence. Langstroth, poor guy, he, um, he didn't really benefit from the patent to his equipment because he did not patent the important uh, discovery that he had made, which was bee space. If you leave a quarter to a three-eighths of an inch from the frame to the edge of the box, bees won't tack that down. Um, he patented the whole hive, and it was possible to prove that um, wooden hives had existed, boxes had existed, movable cranes had existed. That wasn't, those weren't innovations. So that's, that's the little teeny bit that he added. Then as scientists began to kind of look at the bee, we've come to understand the bee is a super organism. You can't have a bee, really it's not true that a bee can go out and live a whack on a little leaf and live through the night. The bee is going to die because the bee can't live on its own. Uh, her own, actually. Uh, the unit of survival is the hive or colony. And this is uh, Dr. Tom Seeley, who um, Frank was trying to get us a, a film of what he was doing there. And I've gotten a chance to, to work with him in the field at a conference and see how this works. It's really cool. Um, so if you get a chance to do that, that's, that's one of the, the great uh, moments in beekeeping. But the unit of survival is really the hive. 
And it makes decisions. The hive makes decisions. The king isn't really directing the, uh, the work of the hive. It's really the hive itself that's making a decision as a collective. There's another model which illuminates something about a hive we have all paid almost no attention to. Philip Chandler pointed out to us that the, the bee that we're calling a queen lays the eggs that hatch in the hive. So she's the mother of every single bee in that hive. Almost. Uh, there is an exception. Um, so she, she lays eggs that hatch into female bees who are our workers. And they're all sisters and half-sisters. She lays eggs that hatch into male bees that are her genetic uh, uh, identical clones. There's no uh, genetic material from other male bees at all. They're her clones. And they're uh, a band of brothers, is what they are. Uh, the, the difference is that drones can move from hive to hive. You may have heard this in your class, and the club all knows this. Um, so a drone is always welcome in every hive. One of the decisions we made about industrial beekeeping is that we decided that drones were useless. <coughs> drones, we didn't need that many, many drones um, because they don't contribute to honey production, right? So we, we tell the bees to make about half of the drones, half of the drones that they will if we give them their own head, which is very interesting. And I think um, another thing that this points out to us is that we talk about moving home from hive to hive because we're still working with this model that there are workers, and workers are interchangeable, right? But if you think about taking sisters and putting them in somebody else's family, you might notice that you've disrupted some things there, and you want to pay attention to that. So we're just starting to talk about that kind of idea, and I think it's important to know that. So that's the way we've thought about these. So how are we keeping these today, and in America in particular? Well, in America, we brought bees to this continent in the 1600s. There were a couple of three hives that were the initial event. Uh, the Apis mellifera, the western honeybee, is in every continent but Antarctica. So it spread across the continent and naturalized, you know, set up colonies and trees. Um, and this is a picture of a homestead. It's a sad moment, actually. This is a, a picture of, it's called the Telling the Bees. There's this idea that when the beekeeper dies, then you go out and tell <coughs> the bees that the beekeeper has died. So that's what's going on here. But you can see, you know, that there's a scout and there's a lot of space and there's a lot of space. And that held true. That model of small hives in the backyard or in the homestead held true until the Industrial Revolution. About 1850, we got Langstroth hives in this country, and there were um, operations that started to commercially produce honey and honeycomb. I love this image because you're going to see some trucks in a minute. This is the first way that we did that, to, to take large quantities of honey uh, in different places. And that really kind of crashed the idea that you have a, a beehive in your backyard. So by 1950, there were almost no people keeping bees like we do, like all the people in this room are doing or going to do. Um, there were just commercial operations. But in 1950, it was still possible to start that commercial operation by going out into the woods and cutting down a tree and getting the bees from it. And that changed. So it was possible for these large commercial operations to make money by selling honey. And that stopped being um, really viable in about 2000. The, the Chinese honey um, China started dumping honey on the market. Remember the, um, the open trade agreements? That's one of the consequences. Um, and we tried to put a tariff on Chinese honey, but they've been shipping it through other countries so it's not coming out of the country. So if you, uh, if you go to the um, American Honey Association website, they will tell you <laughs> as much detail as you want to know about how that's working. But in general, uh, beekeepers don't, don't really make a lot of money from keeping honey these days in large operations. What they do is pollinate. Each one of those um, Langstroth boxes can stack on another box, and you can fit 200 of them on a truck. And that's what they do. They put them on trucks and take them all around the country. Well, that's, that's where we came from the horse and buggy. You have heard, this is a, a very common meme, that there, about a third of our crops are pollinated. <coughs> and I have a list, so I don't have to remember. Um, so there are all the fruits, apple, peach, blueberry, strawberry, raspberry, kiwi. There are all the um, brassicas, kale, lettuce, broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. There's things you wouldn't expect, maybe. Onions are pollinated, beets, okra, and celery. 
And then the nut, Brazil nut and cashew and almond. And what happens for beekeepers? No worries. But the, what she who's still going has not gone off the wrong one. Um, what beekeepers do is they take these trucks and they put them in and they, they pollinate. And they're pollination circuits. So in the northeast you have um, fruits, you have in the southeast the citrus fruits, and you have that in Texas too. In the um, Great Lakes region you have cranberries and blueberries and more fruits. And then you have those as well here. We have apples and cherries. Cranberries are pollinated, actually. Uh, pears and plums. Alfalfa in the middle of the uh, country. What's in the middle here? You guys know this. This pop is corn. That's what there is. I have traveled all around the country, and what there is out there in that big empty space is corn. It's everywhere, and that's all there is out there. Um, and then there's sunflowers, and apples, and melons, and almonds in California. And Dave Hackenberg talks. He's, he's our biggest beekeeper. He has 80,000 colonies. <laughs> There's a lot of colonies, and that's a lot of trucks. I think I calculated it at 400 trucks. Uh, so he's got a lot of people that he employs. And he goes and goes to the almonds, and then he goes down to melons, and then he goes up to fruit. And did you see almonds go by? You should see almonds go by. Almonds are very important to know about because three quarters of the nation's hives go to almonds in February. And Ted and I have, have driven through there, and this is what it looks like. There's a row of, two or three rows of um, trees, and then a row of, of um, flat uh, hives for miles and miles and miles. That is all there is. All the bees in the country, just three quarters of the bees in the country, so there's a lot of bees, go to almonds in February. Is it true that the almond honey can't be eaten? Almonds don't make nectar, so we don't make honey from almonds. It's strictly a pollination service. So, and <coughs> you just go by, actually. That's a, that's kind of an issue. So yeah, no, um, there are kinds of honey that you don't want to eat. And uh, maybe we can pull off and I can, and I can talk to you about it. Rhododendron honey is said to make you yeah. a man. <laughs> there was a cruise report just yesterday that said that why the beer in California is supposed to run out of water. Yes. That kind of thing. It, affects, it affects all the crops in California, yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> most particularly almonds because almonds are a tree. So if, you have, if you're, all your onions die this year, you need to plant more onions next year. If all your almond trees die, you're screwed. You know, social media hasn't improved the um, the sense of calm in media um, reports. So they'll they'll say the most outrageous things to get you to click on something. You know, so the trees, all the almond trees are dying next year. Maybe not. Um, but there, you know, we can we can look at issues and understand nuances. Really important to understand that almonds are just this huge monoculture crop, and that's where our bees are, and that's where colony yeah. collapse disorder is, right? Yeah, he's the only one. I, I love that. If we die here, we're taking a few of this. You see that on Facebook a lot. Yeah, yeah because what happened in uh, 2006, there were beekeepers who had very large uh, operations. Dave Hackenberg, Dave Mendes. Dave Hackenberg, I mentioned, he's the big one, 80,000. Um, Eric Wilson from Eastern Washington, where 90% of the crops are pollinated. Uh, everybody goes down and drops their, their bees and almonds, and then they go and take their crews and open the, the hives, start prepping them to move, splitting them. And in 2006, it was a bad year because that's the year the colony collapse hit. Um, they lost between, different, different beekeepers lost between 30 and 90% of their hives. Really bad year. Now, there are lots of ways bees can die. <laughs> you will become acquainted with many of them. Um, and we were just starting to talk about the ways that we have lost our bees this year. You can starve them. You can, um, they can lose their queen. Um, you can um, drop enough poison on them that it kills them. But this was a particular way that the bees died. They, um, we didn't see large um, quantities of bees outside the hives, dead bees. We saw something we'd never seen before. There was um, stores and brood and a queen, but there were no workers. They had gone out and never come back. So that, and, and the hive cannot survive without worker bees or citizen bees, or plebeian bees, or sister bees. You can't survive, right? So we started looking at why that was. If you look at Facebook much, you know why that was. It was neonicotinoids. 
we are, we are certain of it. And, and in Europe, they banned neonics and you know, colony collapse style facts. So we've got all of these efforts to ban this, this kind of pesticide. And you'll see um, our local firebrand, very, very uh, sweet guy, Taylor Beebe, he will run a grade down to Lowe's once a year. He'll advertise this on our list. And some of our beekeepers will go and put out their bee suits. And the, the most conservative people, in fact, will go and do this to, to try to get this word across. But it's not just neonics. That it's not just Munich. The um, when they, we first started seeing colony collapse, um, Eric Wilson and Dave Mendes went and contacted Marianne Fraser at Penn State, and she started studying bees. She found a beekeeper who had frozen samples of comb for 20 years, and so she looked at the comb and she saw the buildup of pesticides in the comb. So here's what she found: she found 170 pesticides, and she said, "Here's what concerns me: we don't know the effect of a single pesticide on a single bee." We don't know the effect of a single pesticide on a hive. That's one pesticide. Miticides, all these things. So there's an additive effect, too. We don't know the effect of all of these things together on the individual bee and on the hive. Um, we don't know, too, what new things are being made <coughs> in the, fact, in the, uh, in the laboratories, because uh, you only get a five-year patent and to, to profit from something, you know, and then you know, things move on. So there are a lot of concerns about the number of pesticides that we have. And one, one thing she, she found is that it's simply impossible to avoid. All of our bees are exposed to pesticides wherever they go. There are diseases. You will hear about the Varroa mite. There's a bit of a demonization going of the Varroa mite, but it was really a bad moment. So, um, in 1980, the Varroa mite um, jumped from Apis serrani to Apis mellifera, made it to here in 1980, and it destroyed a lot of colonies. I mean, the commercial beekeepers died, uh, had, had bees died, and much of the feral populations died. So many that people will tell you that there are no feral populations. There are, but, um, but it did definitely hit them. Do you have a question? I do. I, you yeah. mentioned uh, different you know, pesticides and things like that, but I was also concerned as, you know, kind of heard things about how GMOs are affecting. You know, it's, and it's a good question, too, um, because bees will go to crops that are um, not necessarily crops that they will, um, that, that we understand them to go to, but they'll go to them, like corn. GMO corn is something that bees will go and, and collect the pollen. So we don't know the effect of, um, of the genetically modified pollen on a beehive either. And it's a, it's a good point. Um, I'm gonna do another lecture for the club in the next like six months or so, and go drill down into natural beekeeping, where I will get you a lot more detail on these kinds of things about what we're, what we're doing about it. So I'll give you the history part. Um, so diseases, um, pests and diseases uh, are, are endemic. Uh, that's the varroa mite distribution around the world, so it's everywhere. It's in here and there too. When I started out as a natural beekeeper, I thought, oh, if I keep my colony um, isolated, then I will keep the varroa mite out, and you can't because it's everywhere. Um, and my beekeepers told me this, and they were right, and mentors did. Uh, there are other mites and um, pests and diseases that affect the honeybee as well. So you add that to the, um, to the pesticides, and to nutrition, you had a really important point. You said, what about, you know, bees are, are collecting almonds. Bees collect pollen. We usually start our meetings with calling out the pollen that we've seen. I've seen Onothera, um, uh, current, wild current here locally. Um, there are all the, the um, scotch cream's about to come in, right? It's going to come in early this year. And they collect lots and lots and lots of different kinds of pollens and use them in different ways. They'll eat them. They use them as medicines. Um, and also, they collect nectar. What we do is we put hives in various places where they can collect the kind of nectar we want. So like uh, fireweed, we'll put them in mountains and get fireweed. Um, so what do they have in the almonds? They have almonds. That's all they have. So they don't have a nectar source. So we feed them, and we feed them high fructose corn syrup, which again is, you know, if you, know, if you tried to live on a diet of jello, you know, or <laughs> ice cream, you'd probably not be all that healthy. So we're concerned about the nutrition of the bees as well. And then we're concerned about the genetics. We have an extremely narrow band of genetics that these bees are coming from. We had the initial event that populated the country in the 1600s. There were a couple of hives. In 1922, we stopped <coughs> importing bees because we wanted to keep the tracheal mite out of the country. And we did until 1987, you know, when it came. Um, but we're still, we still have a band. Right? We, we don't get new genetic material. Now, one of the things we do is we get Dr. Steve Shepard from Washington State University, um, their entomology department. He will come and talk to us about genetics. 
and he, he, he goes out, this is awesome, he goes out and he collects sperm from bees all around the world. And he has many, many, many exciting stories about where he goes and how, you know, what the, the physical process is of doing that and bringing it back. So they're trying to introduce new genetic material um, into, into the bee population. The other thing about honeybee genetics is that um, Dr. Deborah Delaney, who's one of the Steve Shepard students, says there are 500 queens in the country that are populating all those hives. 1.6 million hives, 2 million hives. There are um, 500 queens in two areas in California and the southeast. So you can see that the genetic problem like, is very, very small. So you add all of those things together, right? You add um, the effective pesticides, you add and, and the cumulative effect. It's not just the endocannabinoids. Um, you add the effect of nutrition, of honeybee genetics, of pests, and you've got a bee that's really in a lot of trouble, right? And so there's an end game. There are a couple of directions that we can go with this. One of the end games is that you've got miles and miles and miles of almonds. You've got this monoculture, and it's managed by robots. The image on the left is a pesticide sprayer that is now, today, spraying the almond orchards. It's an automatic thing. <coughs> what um, the laboratories are working on is a robot bee. I'm not making this up. I think I may have it in your handout. A robot bee that can live in that environment. Now, you get the, the most hard-bitten, you know, long-term beekeeper, and he'll say, you know, you take these bees, and you put them in an environment like this, and they die. It's not just the bees that I'm concerned about, it's humans, you know, how are we going to live off the food we grow in that environment? There are other ideas about the direction that we can go as well. So beekeepers are starting to feed sugar syrup, and I've, I've seen these guys, they've got families to support, kids to put in college, and they turn to their supplier and they go, okay, I'm, I'm stopping high fructose corn syrup, I'm going to sugar, let's, let's talk about the discount you can give me, right? So you guys are all going to feed sugar, sugar water if you feed it all. Um, and that's an important thing for the bees. Another thing that, um, that can happen, the people who have those monocultures can plant forage. They can plant other things besides almonds. And that's something that the industry is definitely talking about. Another thing they can do is dial back on the, the chemicals that they throw down on those things. Um, we can increase genetic diversity. There are other things we can do. The thing that... Um, the United Nations has been telling us for a long time is that our form of agriculture, which we're trying to export to the world, is not ultimately sustainable. We will run out of oil. We do run out of the ability for um, the bees to, to adapt, for living organisms to adapt to the chemicals. And they, um, I've got a link in your, um, in your bibliography, they keep putting out reports saying, you know, we've studied it, and small organic farms will support <laughs> The, the world's population, and we have them here in Kitsap. The great thing about being in Kitsap is that all we have is small farms. We don't have any large fields of anything. So, um, and some of those people who are keeping those farms are organic. Most of them are natural, but there's there's one certified organic. She's a beekeeper, and that's what the farmers are doing too. They're also starting to keep bees. I'm like, yes, you can, you know, understand our challenges. And so. There are these two sort of directions we can go in. There's the robot direction or the you know willingly direction. And frankly, you know, in my lifetime, we're going to be going in both those directions. It's going to be very interesting. You know, your your children's children will see how that plays out. But in the short term, um, we can keep bees. Now, I'll give you just a little statistic. Are the bees dying? Yes, they are. Are they going to die next year? No, they're not. There are commercial beekeepers. Um, you have, uh, this is important actually. My first year of beekeeping, dropped a, a, a package in a box, and Ted called me and said, oh my god, there, there's only half of the bees left in that box. And I, I lay awake all night going, I had a colony collapse disorder. I don't lost my bees. I was crying. I woke up the next day and he called me and he said, okay, I found the swarm. And then we had another adventure, which you've just heard about. <laughs> right. So you're not going to see a colony collapse disorder here. You see it in almonds. You see it in very large monocultures out there in the world. You don't see it in backyards like here. There are other things that might get your bees. There's pest pesticide kills, but they're not, you're not going to see colony collapse disorder. So when we say the bees are dying, what we mean is it's becoming not economically viable 
for those large pollination services to keep doing their job because they have a certain number of losses they can sustain before they can't put their kids through college anymore, right? So that actual number of losses they can sustain has actually gone up as beekeepers learn how to deal with this new environment. So in 2006, they said, we can only lose 10% of our bees, man, we're done. Now we're up to 18%. Sadly, however, the losses have hovered around. The average has been 28%. So you see, one year it goes up, one year it goes down, but we're still losing about a third of our bees, right? So that's not sustainable over the long term. You have a, there you go. Yep, and here. Um, so back here at beekeeping, we can keep bees. Um, there aren't, I don't think, there are any pollinators with more than a thousand bees in the club. I know we have some people who have several hundred bees in um, fairly, you know, medium-sized operations. They might describe themselves as small, and would be easier to see if you describe yourself. Yeah, medium-sized, maybe. Um, <coughs> so, you can do with your bees pollination services, and farmers need this. Local farmers need this. If you, um, actually this is a hot tip, if you want to keep bees but you don't know where you can keep them, go to Stedman's and tell them you're interested in that because every year they get people calling them asking them for bees, for people to keep bees on their property. And if you're looking for a little business, putting beekeepers together with people who need bees is actually a hot, hot idea. Somebody did that with gardens in Seattle, right? So you could do that here. Um, so pollination services, artisan honey. You, if you make honey and sell it, um, you will you will never run out of customers. I, when I, the years I was president, I had way more requests for honey than we were than we could possibly fill. People, we we are the people in the world who eat the most honey. You know, we're sweet sweet tooth people, right? So people love this and they love artisan honey, um, and they don't really know that the honey on the shelves in the supermarket isn't really honey. Um, but when they do find out, they come to get your honey, right? So, um, and we, we, uh, we do a honey tasting at the fair where we introduce people to the taste of real honey. Yeah. Uh, glory, glory beekeeping, glory yeah. bee That's yeah. real honey. Glory bee, yeah. That's real honey. Glory. Oh, yeah. Because oh, Central Market needs to start honey. So that's yeah. good to know. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting. Costco has something they're calling organic honey, and I really haven't investigated it. <laughs> really? Because it's all, you know, how can you tell? Good. Three miles? You have a three mile organic. I want to live there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is the stuff in the store? It's not real. Stuff in the store is Chinese, um, and what they do, or, or you know, comes from through Indonesia. What they do is they ultra filter it so there's no pollen in it. The yeah. USDA yeah. says that you have to have pollen in it or it's not honey. Yeah. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah, if I were. Because that, yeah, right. and the reason they're ultra filtering it um, is because then they can find out where it comes from and they can try to track it back to China and stop it here. So, oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, people, independent um, laboratories go and pull that stuff off the shelves and test it and they find no, no. antibiotics and uh, heavy metals and <laughs> what kinds of rice syrup. Yeah, yeah. But send it to your send it to your stuff, get yourself a jar of the real stuff or make it yourself. <laughs> All right, um, you can do, um, you can supply bees. We have a guy, this is a hot tip for you guys, Jason Neal, Star Valley Apiary. Um, he raises queens and he will sell nukes. If you want a local line, that's the guy to go to. Uh, Star Valley Apiary, or Jason Neal, just post on the list and say, Jason, can I have a queen? And then he'll call you. He doesn't have a website. He's got a phone number. Yeah, last week. He's yeah, going to last week. Okay, you know, yeah. yeah, get in. The next time you watch the movie, yeah, get in. I've been looking for him. Yeah. I asked him what he thought a sustainable apiary was. Because he said that was for what he wanted to have a sustainable apiary. I said, what does that mean? And he said, it means that I can replace the hives that I lose. So that's what he's, he's not so much about honey, he's about bees. It's a choice. You can educate yourself. Watch the film. Talk to people. Keep up with the current um, knowledge. And another thing you can do to help the bees is to be open to new ideas. Something I love about this book is that this book always welcomes people walking in the door and talking about bees, whatever our, our perspective. I've seen other clubs actually split along the, um, you, you, had a, you had a class where you had lengths with people over here and top bar people over here. And other clubs have become two clubs. And here you have, you know, all of the people working together. Because all of our bees come from the same place. You put it in order for, uh, for packages. You're going to get the van from Stedman's. It goes down to California, loads to California bees, and you know, and comes back up. So your bees are part of that same mega system, even if you're just keeping them in your backyard. So it's all Italian bees. Um, you can get Italians according to Italians. Then they'll just be Italians. <laughs> 
And Deborah Delaney, uh, no, it, wasn't, it was somebody else, but uh, one, of the, one of the researchers said that if, if they sell you Italians and Carniolans, they are separate strains. They're not quite what they would have in Europe these days, but they are, you are getting what you look for. So this is important to know. I want to talk about some of the young beekeepers who have inspired me in my travels around, listening to um, people who talk at conferences. The millennials are really getting ahead of these issues and saying, hey, we can solve this. I think this is just fantastic. All of the people I'm going to show you are commercial beekeepers. Commercial beekeepers, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hives each of them have had in the course of doing their, their work. So Elise Watson came from Canada. She grew up in Calgary, Alberta, where the farmland is 200,000 an acre. She wanted to be a farmer, and she said, well, I can get bees and put it on somebody else's property. And she found that there was this huge interest in keeping bees, and so has turned to education. Um, I will, when I do the National Bee Keeping Lecture, I'll talk to you about this picture, because she showed me how to do a split uh, in a top bar that was a very easy method to do. And she told us, Actually, she said, when you think about it, you know, bees have been around for 100 million years. We say, are we killing the bees? You know, I don't know that we actually have the power to do that. What the bees are showing us is what we're doing to ourselves. <laughs> I think that was a very important message. She's lovely. Uh, Bob Redman from the Urban Bee Company, he's come and talked to the club. He's a real fun guy. He grows, um, he, he drops his, his hives in somebody's backyard and charges them for this. It's in Seattle. It's in Seattle, yeah. He's the Urban Bee TV. Um, and he, he gets honey from the, the hive, you get a little bit of the honey for your, for your price, and then he delivers it on a bicycle. So he's a very, um, a lot of these people are looking ahead to the post-industrial future. What the coolest thing was that he did, was he went to the airport and said, hey, you've got all this land that nothing is happening on, and all this wonderful forage, can I drop some hives on it? He and two other beekeepers went and dropped a bunch of hives, 100 hives, um, 180 I think. If you go through, if you're going to the airport, go to Concourse B because there's a little uh, display about it. Uh, and there's a there's a plexiglass case that you find in a museum where you go and you see some valuable 5,000 year old antiquity. And what they have in that case is a beat up old smoker. I think it's so cool. <laughs> because the smoker. Uh, Kat Nisbet, um, she ran two treatment-free beekeeping conferences. Um, she's not going to do it this year. You missed your chance. Next year, yeah. Uh, we learned a lot from a lot of people there. What she's done, though, is she's moved to Medford, Oregon, where she and now her husband um, are on a, a farm that's been there for since it was homesteaded. And they are not using as much gasoline as they can. They're plowing with oxen. Yeah. Melanie Kirby um, started out as a commercial beekeeper. She went into doing uh, queen rearing because genetic strains are important and founded the Rocky Mountain Bee Collective. Um, the great thing about that is that it's um, almost all women, almost all top bar. So those of you ladies out there who are into top bar, you know, it's, it's a hot ticket. Um, and she went down to Jamaica and donated some equipment to uh, Natural Beekeeping Collective there. And I look at that and I say, well, <laughs> I am not worthy. Think about it with my life, you know? I really admire her. I, I really admire all these people. They've done fantastic work. I didn't think I was going to like Sam. I mean, he's pretty much an off the front anarchist. He's got an anarchist symbol on his webpage. But this was a guy who, uh, you know, you know how Dave Hackenberg has those like 400 trucks? Who takes care of those bees? It's not Dave. You know, he's got lots and lots and lots of employees. So that's how Sam came into the business following around with one, with one of those trucks. And he said, the point at which he came up to a, a field and there, uh, the, the bees have been delivered and so has the barrels of oxalic acid and he dumps them in the hive and he goes, oh, this isn't right. So he called his, he called his uh, employer and said, I don't want money this year, I want bees, and started off on his own. So he's really, um, he does anything. He takes two pieces of wood and slaps them together and drops bees in them. I mean, he, he just, uh, he, he will, he will teach you how to keep bees, and he keeps, um, all of these people keep uh, no feeding, no treatment of bees. And a lot of top bar, yeah. So where in the world do people keep bees? This is your, you lived through the history lecture, and this is the payoff. You get to see some pretty pictures. Um, in China, there was a flood, and they lost all their nice because so they just, you know, grabbed some, <laughs> grabbed some logs, threw some, you know, salvaged lumber on it, because you can keep bees in anything. It's not fair to tar China with that brush, though. I mean, they do have um, serious, serious agriculture, serious honey. In addition to the honey dumping that they do, there are people who do artisan honey. Look at her. She's got a lot of different kinds of honey and pollen, too. What a wonderful field. 
The picture on the right demonstrates to you that you can keep bees in anything. <laughs> like, it looks like some big drawers were put together. We had a couple of, a couple of dogs. <laughs> but on the left hand side, George would have made that too. It's a, a beautiful array hive, and it sits on top of a plant that is known to attract bees. So, lots of ways to keep bees. We've got in, uh, line scripts gone around the world, and in Indonesia we have line script hives, and they're very beautiful. In India, we have a woman keeping top bar. Women gravitate to top bar partly because it's way easier to lift one of those bars than in a box. Um, and also, it's really easy to like, you know, put, put bars in any gear at all. And you, you have a little frame. This is interesting. In Africa, um, the elephants will trample a field where people are trying to grow um, uh, crops, production crops. And so what they'll do is they'll put fences around those fields that have beehives on them because the elephants really don't like bees. So that's one way of doing it. That's an actual Kenyan top bar hive. If you've heard the term top bar hive and you hear Kenyan, Kenyan's a particular style that looks like that. We don't keep um, Kenyan, we keep old and neat top bar hives. <laughs> top bar is very, very particular. You can keep bees in anything, really, anything, any kind of thing at all. There's this wonderful people in Jamaica again. You've got a lot of women and children keeping bees, and they're keeping top bar, Kenyan top bar. In Jordan, they're still keeping bees in those tubes that you saw in the archaeological exhibitions. So, um, and also in wood, anything at all that you can um, you can grab to keep bees in. And you notice though that the bee suit is a really important innovation. I think that maybe the, the big wager of the world is a bee suit that you can keep bees out of you with. He's doing the same thing. He's got some uh, tubes, he's got some boxes, he's got a movable frame. So in, uh, in Yemen, they're doing good, but he doesn't have bees in here. There was this beekeeper who went to Egypt, saw a bee, tracked it down to where it was coming from, and said, you know, managed to communicate to the man, I'd like to know where the bees come from. And he trotted him over to his apiary, which looks pretty much like that, that picture. Um, he wasn't able to talk enough Egyptian or Arabic to, to find out all the things he wanted to know, but it's a, it's a great image. You find um, in Eastern Europe in particular, but in parts of the world, you find Langsworth and you'll find in big, um, find lots of pictures of, of big installations like that. One in Newton Island too, you know, people keep using sheds to keep the water off them. And a lot of women are keeping these. I belong, I, uh, one of my charities is Women for Women International. We teach people around the world, how to, uh, women around the world, how to improve their lives and make money for their family. And one of the things I'm really proud of is that in Albania, we're teaching women to keep these. Wow. In Greece, they still put, this is where bee comes from, Mediterranean bee, um, and they still put hives up in the thyme fields and get thyme honey. Down they in. put them on the rocks, <laughs> wherever they can fit those. Those are pretty, I want a blue bee hive now. We got lavender bee, I want a blue bee hive. In France, in the Pyrenees, they do things more beautifully than we do in France. They have bee hives and sunflowers. They have the Garden of Luxembourg, these beautiful <laughs> rooms on their hives. In England, we're keeping bee, uh, bees on rooftops. Um, we've, we've eaten honey from New York City rooftops. Urban environments are really good keep, place to keep bees. Yeah, the rooftop is great because it keeps it out of your neighbor's way. So that's a kid, but you got to see this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do more of these as we go on. So, that, uh, so the, the beekeeper is a child, so you can get the perspective. But that's, that's really a beehive, and they're really keeping them that way in Oslo. So people are starting to experiment with beehive designs. When I do my next lecture, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of those. But it's really fun. That's the most beautiful. I, I put into Google, most beautiful beehive, and this popped up. I thought, you know, I'll buy it, actually. I think that's quite a pretty beehive. It took somebody a while. <coughs> you know, <so> <laughs> <laughs> you know so that Baz is being taught to detect American fowl brood. Oh. So those of you, you know, who are working with dogs, there's a hot tip. And I gotta show you the Brazilian, the club members know the Brazilian donkey. If you've got hives in the, in the hills and you don't have a truck to get up there, how are you gonna get up there? There he goes, he's gonna get his money. Yeah. All right, I only went five minutes over. Thank you everyone so much for your attention. It's awesome.